Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Jackie Jacob. I am one of two poultry specialists here at the University of Kentucky. The other one is Dr. Uh, Tony Pescatori. He's the other guy there, so you want to uh, wave. <laughs> um, we are doing a series of uh, webinars. It is Kentucky specific, but um, genetics is the same everywhere. So um, everybody is welcome to join us. Uh, this is being recorded and will be available for later viewing for those that are interested. Um, I will be doing the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions at any time, feel free to type them in the chat box or the Q&A box. Uh, Dr. Pescatori will be keeping an eye on it. And if it's something that is a clarification of what I'm talking about, he will interrupt me um and pop up and do ask me the question otherwise uh we'll wait and hold the questions to the end my cat's here to bug me let me share my screen and oops come on are you seeing that as a slideshow tony oh there it is oops i went too fast where'd it go what happened? What happened? There. Are you seeing it as a slideshow, Tony? Uh, I'm going to assume yes. If yes. Not. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this is a webinar series that Dr. Piscatori and I are hosting, uh, again, from the University of Kentucky. Uh, today's webinar is, on, uh, is an introduction to poultry genetics. Next week, we'll look at some of the genetics related to some specific poultry traits, followed by the next week on breeding programs and selecting breeders. And we'll finish up on the 29th with incubation and operating a small commercial hatchery in uh, Kentucky. So the first um, lecture today is on an introduction to poultry genetics. Now, genetics can be very uh, confusing and um, encompasses a lot of information. I don't expect you all to become geneticists, um, but I want to give you an introduction to how genetics work. And then next week, we'll look at specific traits such as plumage, comb type, and, and whatnot. So everything that happens in every cell of a living organism, plant or animal is directed by DNA. DNA uh, makes RNA, which makes proteins and proteins determine the functioning of the body. So in an adult, they are involved in digestive enzymes, immune system, they help the body move and, um, regulate all the different activities with hormones and whatnot. But what we're focusing on mostly is in the embryo because DNA will dictate the development of the organs, the development of the limbs and other body parts. So when it comes to combs, how are combs uh, developed, the DNA produces protein, which uh, helps to direct the uh, development of the embryo. And uh, DNA is in the nucleus of each cell. So the nucleus has chromosomes, which transmit genetic material from one generation to the next, and they come in pairs. And the chromosomes are made up of DNA. Uh, the, a gene is a portion of that DNA. So it's on the DNA molecule and it's the basic unit of heredity. So it determines feather color, comb type and whatnot. And again, they come in pairs, one from each parent. D 
DNA and RNA are made up of nucleic acids. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid and RNA stands for ribonucleic acid. So in DNA, there are pairs, it's a double helix um, that have uh, the four different types of um, nucleic acids. Uh, most of them are the same, it's a little bit different in the RNA. Um, occasionally, a mutation will occur in the replication and the duplication of the DNA, and that can change the nature of the protein. So a lot of the different things we see come from mutations that occurred in the natural um, form of the DNA. So uh, spermat spermatogenesis, for example, it happens the same with the ovum for the female portion but the DNA duplicates, splits, and you get it going out into the um, sperm. And so when it duplicates and splits, you can get mutations that occur. And genes need to be turned on to work. They're not always on. They have a promoter sequence, a template sequence that makes the, the protein and a termination sequence that says it's complete. And in a, an, a body of an adult uh, or a, a whole organism, different things will activate the DNA to, to function. So this is just an example of uh, something inducing the gene to work. But uh, in basic uh, understanding, there's the promoter sequence, the template sequence, and the termination sequence. And the mutation can occur anywhere. It can occur in the promoter sequence so that the template does not get turned on, or in the termination sequence so it doesn't get turned off so that there is too much. It could also be in the template sequence so that a malformation of the protein occurs. So some terminology. Alleles are different versions of a gene on a chromosome that determine a specific heritable trait. And a locus is the position on the chromosome at which the allele is found. The plural of locus is loci. So if you have more than one locus, you have multiple loci. So the alleles are the different versions of a single gene. Genes on the same chromosome are linked, can be linked. Well, on the same chromosome, they are linked and usually inherited together. And you can see this is a genetic map from chromosome 20. It has a lot of different genes. What? Okay, uh, genes on them. Sorry, my phone is talking to me. Um, so when, when that whole chromosome is inherited, it is going to um, get all those traits linked together. Linkage is never 100% because crossover events can occur uh, when you're getting those sperm and egg cells. And the rate of crossover is usually proportional to the distance between the two genes. So if genes are far apart, they're more likely to get crossed over into other chromosomes or um, if they're close together, it won't happen so much. So basically, this just shows you the chromosome crossover where you get one part of one going to the other when it's duplicated and getting ready to make the sperm. Um, so if you remember from the human genome, if you're familiar with that, X and Y are the sex chromosomes. They determine the sex of the individual with XX being female and XY being male and everybody has one pair of sex chromosomes. Autosomes are those that do not determine the sex of the offspring. And in humans, there are 22 pairs. So if we compare that to chickens, chickens also have sex chromosomes. They're just not X and Y. 
they are Z and W. And in chickens, the male is ZZ and the female is ZW. So it's the female that determines the sex of the offspring and not the male. So it's the reverse of mammals. Um, so you can do anything you want to the sperm and you're not gonna change the sex uh, of the offspring. And instead of 22 pairs of uh, autosomal chromosomes, they have 38 pairs, but they have them of different sizes. You can see that in the, the diagram there, some are large, some are small. And of those 38 autosomal chromosomes, five are considered macro, five are intermediate, and 28 are considered micro. And although they're small, they have the highest density of genes uh, compared to the, the macros, and they have the highest rate of recombination by crossover. So they're small but mighty. Okay, um, if the alleles are the same, so if the different forms of the gene are the same, it's called homozygous. So as the example there, BB uh, or B, big B, little b, right there, those are considered homozygous. Heterozygous have different alleles um, so that you, you may have a uh, large B, which is dominant over the lower B. And how these two alleles interact determines the phenotype. So the genotype is what type of alleles you actually have. And the phenotype is what the animal physically looks like. So there's the genetics versus what uh, the individual looks like. And how those genes interact is going to affect the phenotype. And much of what we know about genetics came from a monk named Mendel and Mendelian genetics are still uh, understood today. Um, and he started out with plants. And so um, they found that uh, the purple color P, the capital P for purple, uh, if it's homozygous for the dominant gene, it's purple. If it has the dominant and um, lowercase one, it is heterozygous, but it's still purple. And if it has the two uh, lowercase p's, homozygous for the low, the, the recessive form, then it was white. And so, although the phenotypes uh, are the genotypes is a one-to-one -one relationship when you they crossed them, the um, phenotype, what they looked like, was a three to one. So um, the first understanding of genetics came from using plants, uh, but chickens were used to show that Mendelian genetics do work for animals as well. So some of the laws uh, from Mendelian genetics, the first is the law of segregation. Every parent's pair of genes or alleles divide and a single gene uh, passes from every parent to an offspring. And which particular genes of the pair that get passed on is entirely up to chance, which sperm affects, uh, fertilizes which egg. So this just gives you an example. The chromosome number is halved into the gametes, gametes being the reproductive um, cells. Parents pass on one allele of the pair. Uh, so they're passing on 50% of the genes. The progeny receive two alleles, one from each parent and recombination can occur in each of the individual gametes to give rise to different combinations of alleles. The law of independent assortment, discrete pairs of alleles pass on to the offspring with, uh, without depending on one another. So the inheritance of genes at a particular region in a genome does not infect the uh, inheritance of genes in a different region. So the 
uh, inheritance of the genes in one chromosome doesn't affect the other. How they function might, but if they're not on the same chromosome. Law of dominance. So recessive, recessive alleles are always masked by dominant alleles. So if one, as the name would, would uh, you know, indicate dominant means that it, it shows over the recessive form. So for example, if the allele has a uh, dominant gene and a recessive, you don't even know that that recessive is there necessarily because the dominant is uh, overpowering it. You only know the recessive if both of the uh, alleles that are received from each parent what, the one from each parent so that both of them are recessive, then it's going to express itself. And this is why sometimes, you know, you get, I get questions all the time, what happens if I cross chicken A with chicken B? And unless you know the genotype of the chicken, there's no way you can, can uh, predict uh, with accuracy what the offspring are going to be, because if it has a dominant and a recessive gene, you won't see that recessive uh, until uh, it meets up with another recessive. So if the female has the dominant form of a particular trait, just trait A, and the male has the recessive form, the, all of their offspring will be heterozygous. They'll have one dominant and one recessive. And if you were to mate the progeny, uh, the, each of them can either donate a dominant A or a recessive A. So you're gonna get um, one quarter that are both uh, dominant A, they're homozygous for dominant, you're going to get one quarter that is re, uh, homozygous for recessive, and you're going to get 50% that have one of each. And if it's just a matter of which one is dominant over the other, three quarters are going to be one kind, uh, and one quarter is going to be different. Um, but we'll get into what happens if it's not completely dominant. But the double, the homozygous would breed true and the heterozygous would not. So there is a thing called incomplete dominance. And so in this case, the allele shows but is stronger in the purebred. So uh, an example is blue color BI, which is a dilution of the black pigment in the feathers. So if you have um, one, uh, if you don't have the BI and also the recessive form, which is the one in the middle. Oh, I've got the colors mixed up. I got my chickens mixed up. Sorry about that. Here, I'm going to change that right now because that bugs me. <laughs> there we go. So, if you have the recessive form, so you're not having any dilution, you have a black chicken. Uh, if you have one of it, then you get the, the dilution of the black and it's called blue or slate. If you have a uh, homozygous for both of them, it, it's an incomplete dominant. So you, you get um, some of the, the most of the feathers are white, but you do get a few specks that can come through. Um, so this is, they call it the blue color, but it's basically a dilution factor on black. This is different from the self blue, which is a totally different mutation that can occur and result in a blue color. So don't, I mean, pick, Different mutations can result in the same thing or same appearance, um, but this is just uh, a simplified version of an incomplete dominance uh, coming through uh, with chickens. So if you were to take a blue female, 
and made it to a blue male, it has one dominant, one recessive gene, so it can donate one or the other. And um, the offspring, if you, you, know, you do a large number of them, 50% of them will be blue, 25% will be black, and 25% will be white with specks. So um, blue with this particular type of uh, mutation, um, this is an example from the Ocelorp, then you don't, they don't bleed, they don't breed true. Codominance is when both alleles are expressed. Um, there isn't a really good example from poultry. For, um, for humans, an example would be blood type. So um, if you have the, the mutation for A and you have the one for B, you can have an AB blood type or an A type or a B blood type or neither and be an O type. So that's co-dominance where both showed through. There isn't a really good example of that with poultry, but um, blood types is a good example in humans. Then of course we have the uh, problem where if the alleles um, are linked on the same chromosome, they start to interact as well. They can, depending on what they are. So interactions between alleles at the single locus can be dominant, recessive, co-dominant, or incomplete dominant. But interactions between alleles at different locations can result in an epistatic event and can get varying effects on the phenotype depending on that interaction between the alleles. Here's an example, and this was one of the first um, animal type of studies that they did with genetics to prove that Mendelian genetics worked with, um, with animals, not just plants. So in epistasis, some genes overrule the effect of other genes. So um, R is a rose comb, P is a P comb and they're both dominant. So if you have a rose comb chicken, it has the two dominant forms of R and the recessive forms of P. Uh, a P comb is gonna have the dominant form of P and the recessive of R. But if you have the uh, dominant of both R and P, you get a walnut comb. And if you have the recessive of both, you get the single comb. Um, and so that's when what the study that they did that showed you know, the Mendelian genetics with animals. So if you take a rose comb female uh, and a P comb male and you cross them together, you get, um, 100% walnut offspring because they all have at least one dominant form of both rose and pico. But when you cross uh, walnut with walnut, then you get uh, one sixteenth are going to be single combs, which are down in the bottom right hand corner because they have the recessive form of both. Um, three sixteenths are going to be P comb because they have at least one dominant uh, P uh, in their thing with the both recessive forms of rows. And same with the three sixteenths that are going to have rose comb because they have at least one dominant um, R to get the rose with uh, the two recessive P combs. And then nine sixteenths are going to be walnut, which have at least one dominant R and one dominant P. So um, that's where you get where you can't say, if I had a walnut comb and I crossed it with a walnut comb, unless you know the pedigree of the birds, you can't know whether it has two 
two dominant forms of the gene or one dominant and one recessive. And then, of course, there's polygenic his in inheritance, which is characterized by multiple genes. So we already saw that with the uh, comb type, there's at least two genes that are involved there. Um, and so there are traits where you can have many different genes involved in controlling the uh, phenotype of the offspring. And it's important to understand the difference between qualitative genetics, which is what we're going to be talking mostly about. These are traits that fit into discrete, discrete categories. So it's usually a single gene or a small group of genes. So comb type, feathers on the shank, plumage color, et cetera. Um, but quantitative genetics is what um, most commercial operations are looking at. These are measurable phenotypes that depend on cumulative actions of many genes and the environment. And the traits vary among individuals over a range to produce a continuous distribution of phenotypes. So body weight gained, um, there's, it can range you know, from slow growing to fast growing and everything in between height, uh, feed efficiency, uh, egg production, uh, egg size, all those different things. The different factors that they look at for selecting for uh, commercial use. And again, it's usually multiple genes involved. Uh, and that's what they look at, at trying to select for commercial traits. But we're focusing more on purebred. So when I talk about the genetics of different traits um, next week, we'll be talking about qualitative genetics. And some different notations that you will see. Par parental generation is P. F1 is the generation of progeny from the parental cross. Uh, and then the progeny of a cross in which one or both parents are from that first cross, then you get an F2. And um, chickens are descended from the jungle fowl, so gene that is the wild type has a plus sign on it. So as I said, chickens are domesticated from the uh, red jungle fowl of Southeast Asia 5,000 to 10,000 years ago. And they base that on mitochondrial DNA. So uh, the mitochondria are the um, power source for the cell and it has its own DNA. And they have decided that uh, based on their genetic studies of mitochondrial DNA, you might have heard of that when with the Human Genome Project tracing um, things back to the first mother or whatever, um, they've decided that it that all the different breeds are uh, from a monophyletic origin. That means one um, evolutionary line. So whether it be bantam sized feather being dark red for males, um, I, sorry, the, the red jungle fowl is a sort of a bantam size, not a large size. The feathering of the male is dark red, brown for the females. Females lay only one clutch of eggs per year during a specific season, and males exhibit an aggressive behavior in an eclipse mole. So um, that's what the, the ancestor of all the different types of chickens come from. Um, chickens were initially uh, raised as a sacrificial animal, and then cockfighting became popular. And in fact, cockfighting was probably more responsible for the spread of chicken than its food producing potential. And so conscientious selection for good fighting birds affected other traits, 
So it affected body size and conformation, reducing the molting period, reducing comb size. So just by selecting for good fighting traits, they also selected for those traits as well. And eventually when they stopped um, raising them for fighting cocks, when it, it be, didn't become good politically anymore, they started uh, doing it as show birds. And there are many different uh, traits that are now seen in a wide variety of chicken types, uh, shank color, earlobe color, uh, comb types, uh, tail length, uh, crests on the head, all those different things um, were mutations or came from somewhere. And so, uh, as I said, the, the uh, red jungle fowl is, for the longest time was believed to be the only source um, for the, and it was the coloring uh, effect. The white earlobe is the natural, the single comb, and um, the, the wa red wattles. But they have since uh, decided that there wasn't, it wasn't just the red jungle fowl, that there was some crossbreeding with some of the other jungle fowl, which brought in uh, other genes and other traits. So the gray jungle fowl has a different plumage color and it has red shanks and red earlobes, although it still does have the single comb. So some of the, the traits may have come from interbreeding with um, other jungle fowl besides the red jungle fowl. There's the gray, the Sri Lanka jungle fowl may have have played a part. Again, different plumage color, pink shanks, red earlobes. It has a modified uh, single comb and the eye color is different. And the green jungle fowl, again, different plumage, gray shanks, red earlobes, modified wattle and um, modified single comb. So there were genes that were brought into the population um, from other jungle fowl besides the red jungle fowl. So they're getting a, a wide variety with the different types of jungle fowl uh, that still exist today, um, but were there when they, the birds were first domesticated. And uh, a lot of the history of some of the older breeds have been lost. But there is a lot of uh, work going on now uh, with genetics trying to trace back to where did uh, all these different um, breeds develop. Uh, so that's a whole different area of um, genetics that, that you're getting a lot of published research in now. Um, I never would have thought that you know, that it was that far back that they couldn't remember how the breeds were developed, but it appears they are. So um, there's a lot of different, different breeds out there and tracing their history is uh, fun on its own. So how did the development of different breeds happen? From the jungle fowl, you get the, um, the other jungle fowl in there. And then, as I said, selecting for fighting is going to affect other traits as well. But um, the breeding of mutations or gene insertions can occur. And then once you get something that's different, then you can breed to keep that there. Um, I used to work in a, um, a quail unit, uh, that specified uh, specifically for genetics. And every time we got a new quail that hatched out, some mutation had hurt, happened you know, on its own, then we would uh, multiply that so that we could understand um, the genes involved. That was before genomes started to exist and we had mapped out the different genes, genes of the 
the birds. Uh, we were still studying how the different genes worked for feather color and all that kind of stuff. Sort of dating myself, but that's what we did for our research. Sometimes you get you know, naturally occurring mutations. Uh, for example, the frizzle feather, um, you get the, the feather starts curling up. And this happened because of a 15 base pair deletion. That's the um, 15 nucleic acid pairs in the F gene of chromosome 33. So in the template, something went wrong and 15 base pairs got deleted from that gene and you got a frizzled chicken and it showed incomplete dominance so that if you have the mutation on both alleles it's more curled than if you just have one of the mutations and one without so uh, this is a naturally occurring um, mutation that occurred and then was uh, multiplied so that it could be, uh, that gene could be in the pool of genes available for breeding poultry. Some um, traits are caused by different mutations. So um, blue, as I said, from, from the dilution was one, self blue is another, that's a totally different gene. Uh, a di totally different mutation that occurred there. Um, there are different traits, um, for example, dwarfism. It, um, different things caused dwarfism, um, which is basically bantams. So uh, an autosomal uh, trait happened. So there was a mutation in the ADW gene resulted in reduced body weight with short stature, despite normal concentrations of growth hormone and insulin-like insulin growth factor. So it affects a different gene and it resulted in a 30 to 40% reduced adult body weight. So that was one mutation that occurred that resulted in dwarfism. There is also a sex-linked uh, dwarfism. So it's a gene that is connected with the Z uh, chromosome, which is one of those sex chromosomes. So the male has two of them, female only has one. Um, and that mutation happened on there and it affects the growth. And it does have commercial value because uh, several broider breeder lines use female parents, made it, female dwarf parents mated to the normal males um, because of reduced feed consumption and a smaller space requirement, um, but results in normal size broiler offspring hatching out. So um, they're both dwarfism, but they're from totally unrelated events that occurred in the development of the chicken. Um, if you cross an autosomal dwarf male with a sex-linked dwarf, all progeny are normal size and give good fertility. So it's um, you know, trying to mix both of them together. Some uh, viruses, I mean, some genes get inserted from a virus, a retrovirus. So the blue shelled eggs in the Araucana chicken of South America, as well as the two breeds in China, originated when a chicken got infected with the retrovirus and it inserted a gene into the chicken's genome that resulted in a blue shelled egg. That does not mean that Araucana chickens are carrying around a virus that's gonna make people sick. No, that happened many, 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 many years ago and resulted in an insertion of a gene into the genome of the chicken and resulted in the blue shelled egg. There are other breeds that lay blue shelled eggs that got that 
in a different way. So as I said, things can happen through different methods um, depending on the trait and breed. Um, you can also follow what um, they did with, they used to do with a lot of plants in order to get different types of maize or whatever, they used to irradiate them to cause a mutation and then um, see what happens. So you could do that with the sperm. I don't know of anyone who is doing that, but the irradiation will cause a mutation and then you sort of wait and see what the mutation comes from. All the different breeds that we have today started out from either a natural mutation that occurred or from a, an insertion by a retrovirus. So um, this was more used for plants than for animals, but it is something that can be used. So that's a, a general overview of poultry genetics. You have genes that control different traits. Alleles are the different forms of the genes. Some are dominant over others. Some are affected by other genes. And so next week, we'll look at the genetics of some poultry traits. I can't go into great detail on all of them because if you wanted to do just uh, on plumage color, I mean, we could talk for five days on all the different interactions of all the different genes involved in, in plumage color and patterns, but we'll look at some of them. Um, then we'll look at uh, breeding programs. So uh, if you wanted to raise your own purebreds, selecting your own breeders and um, maintaining your flock, and then we'll finish up with incubation and operating a small commercial hatchery in Kentucky. So that's what I have today. Again, I said it's just a general introduction um, for uh, an understanding of how poultry genetics works. And then um, we'll, we'll go into more detail and more specifics next week. And I see there was a question, will these slides be available to download? No, I'm afraid they will not, but this is being recorded and you can um, watch it anytime. I will post it on YouTube and on the um, Facebook page for Kentucky uh, Poultry, which is, let's see if I can get that page. Come on, where are you? That's the Facebook page for Kentucky Poultry Extension. Um, the link will probably go up tomorrow morning um, and you can watch it anytime you want or share it or whatever. So does anyone have any questions? You can either type it in the Q&A or you can type it in the um, chat box. I'm not seeing any questions. Are you seeing any questions, Tony? There's none there. None there. I guess this was a uh, an introductory talk into genetics, um, pretty basic, um, but next week when we get into some of the specifics, uh, might be a little bit more questions involved. So thank you for uh, joining us tonight and I hope to see you next week when we'll go into um, more detail uh, with specifics on different genes involved in the poultry traits, uh, like plumage and whatnot. So thank you very much. Okay, Chanticleers, yeah, they're always interesting. Okay, that's it, Tony. I'm gonna stop the recording. Okay.